uh, in this week we are going to this week lectures we are going to discuss about uh, transmission in electron microscopy mm, we are going to discuss a little bit about TEM scattering and diffraction phenomena happening the electron sources detectors pumps and the instrumentation part of the transmission electron microscope and then how the samples are prepared for uh, transmission electron microscope So to start with like what type of materials can we use in TEM TEM is called transmission electron microscope So, as we know, uh, the main reason for using TEM is to characterize the materials uh, having uh, features in nanometers. We, we can able to distinguish between different features uh, in the scale of nanometer. But um, with respect to scanning electron microscope, here we see the samples in transmission mode, whereas in scanning electron microscope, we see the sample in reflected mode. So, what type of materials can we use to study in uh, TEM? We can see materials we can characterize metals, alloys, ceramics, glasses, polymers, semiconductor. and composite mixtures so imaging measuring modeling and manipulating matter all can be uh, accomplished with the help of this transmission electron microscope and this all are also this, all these things also known as nano characterization of our materials so why there is a need of going from light microscopy to electrons so this uh, transmission electron microscopes are developed because of the limited image resolution that we get in light microscope and that is happening because of the wavelength of visible light the wavelength of electron is much smaller than the wavelength of visible light for which it is able to distinguish between very closer objects so we can say advantage of using electron over light lies 
in the wavelength that is offered by electron the wavelength of electron is less than wavelength of light which is also called photon because of this we can resolve very close object so from a de broglie's wave uh, equation we can easily derive this formula for wavelength that is 1.22 divided by root t where here e is an electron volt and lambda we will get in nanometer so let's say for if we use a 100 electron volt kilo electron volt electron having energy 100 kilo electron volt then we can get wavelength of about full we'll calculate 1.22 by 10 to the 5 this will be approximately 0.0039 something nanometer or around 0.004 nanometer or we can say 4 pic so we can say we can the wavelength is even less than the diameter of of an atom which is in the order of angstrom right so one point here to note here is we can see the energy is represented in terms of electron volt so one difference we can note like the v represent the accelerating voltage of microscope and electron volt refers to the energy of electron in microscope so when this electron as we are considering electron for uh, characterizing our material so how this electron interact with the matter so when we incident electron with high energy then many phenomena can happen like we get secondary electron we may get characteristic x rays we may also get visible light get back scattered electrons get auger electrons some electron may be absorbed in the specimen or we, we we can get electron hole pairs or that can go directly pass through the specimen or that can be plastic scattering or we may get electrons from inelastic scattering we can also get bremsstrahlung x rays so is that the different kind of phenomena we get when 
the electron interacts with the specimen. So in TEM, this all this phenomena we consider in uh, SEM, this in XRD, and this all this phenomena we will see in TEM. The transmitted electrons which we get. Next, coming to depth of field and depth of focus. Depth of field of a microscope is a measure of how much of the object that we are looking at remains in focus at the same time. So we may say depth of field. a measure of how much of the object that we are looking at is remain in focus. How it is different from depth of focus? Depth of focus refers to the distance over which the image can move. We can move the image uh, with rel relative to the object and still remain in focus. It refers to the distance. image can move relative to object and still remain in focus here in this picture we can see dm image of dislocation Um, in the crystal here it is given crystal for gallium arsenide here the dislocation appeared to start and finish in the specimen mm, but there actually uh, uh, moving forward through the specimen from top to bottom of the surfaces and they remain in sharp focus all the time so when uh, the, uh, this image is recorded finally at different position the image still in focus so this is a very nice advantage over the visible light microscopy like if the if we would have focused it in visible like microscopy if let's say the this uh, this dislocation are in the order such that visible microscopy can uh, would have able to image it then at different position of the dislocation you, we would have seen a deep focused image because uh, because of uh, as uh, DM have larger depth of field, uh, so it can or depth of focus, it can focus 
at different um, uh, dislocations having different height it will st it will be still in focus but in light microscopy it will become out of focus So next after depth, depth of field and depth of focal focus important parameter to consider is diffraction and it is the most useful aspect for a materials because it gives a lot of information about the crystal structure so here in this picture it contains the information about the crystal structure uh, as in crystal we know the lattice repeat at in, uh, regular interval so it gives information about the specimen shape and this pattern can also be related to the image of the area of specimen from where uh, it came so uh, more about the fraction we will uh, re, uh, encounter in for the topic or uh, while we will move further we will see extensively this diffraction concept so as all characterization tool has limitation this transmission electron microscope also have limitation the first limitation is with sampling So the first price it has to pay for high resolution is that small part of the specimen we can see at one time. So we cannot get information about large part. So higher the resolution. worse the sampling abilities of instrument next interpreting transmission images So TEM shows us 2D images of 3D specimen. So it is not a proper picture of what is there in the reality, right? So all the information that we get from TEM is averaged over the thickness of the specimen. This is uh, also limitation as well as a important uh, factor to remember whatever information we get from the TM images it's basically the averaged information over all the thickness we get 2D information from 3D specimen so information from DM whatever we get is averaged through the thickness of specimen so the next next limitation is 
electron beam damage and safety so whatever electron we are putting they obviously damage specimen particularly specimen like polymers or biological specimens uh, or some minerals or ceramics can also be damaged by the electrons and we get doesn't don't get often the uh, correct information what we need so we have to be very careful about the energy of the electron we use for characterization or characterizing our sample damages specimen or one fourth limitation is specimen preparation it is a very important step in tm like we have to prepare the sample in a certain manner otherwise it is not possible to get correct observation about our specimen so our specimen have to be thin if we want to get any information using this transmitted electron uh, when we say thin thin means electron should feel that the sample is transparent with respect to its energy if you may say so this parameter depends on the electron energy and average atomic number of the specimen which we have so depends on electron energy and average atomic number of our specimen so one example to see like uh, let's say what kind of energy uh, we can see uh, what which can pass through a certain thickness of material like we, we let's say we have a one micrometer specimen then 100 kV an electron having energy 100 kV can penetrate this much thickness easily so so the major limitation of DEM is the need of thin specimen and the way we make the a specimen that sometimes becomes detrimental for it that may change the structure as well as the chemistry of the specimen so we have to be very careful and know the drawbacks of specimen preparation and recognize the artifacts introduced by standard preparation methods that is very important So there are number of TMs we can find. So different kind of TMs which we see are HR TM which is high resolution, TM, HVMs, IVMs, STEMs, AEMs. This stem and so on and so forth. These are different kind of TM which we see in regular basis. So, as we are considering uh, electron in TM, so it is very important to know a little bit fundamental about electrons.
so <coughs> first thing while considering our electron is uh, as we have to consider it as a quantum particle So to know about the as we are considering electron as a quantum particle, so we have to consider the particle as well as the wave aspect of it. The first thing we have to know the de Broglie wavelength, which gives us information about wave particle duality. Like lambda equals to h by p where h is the Planck's constant p is the momentum so in TEF we impact mo momentum to the electron by accelerating it through a potential drop and we give it a kinetic energy EV so this EV must be equal to the energy m not v square by 2 the half mv square which we say and when we equate this to momentum and momentum can be written as 2m0 ev yeah. so our wavelength becomes h by 2m0 ev to the power half so we get an inverse relationship between lambda and potential So here we, we can say by increasing the accelerating voltage we decrease the wavelength of the electron. It's a very important point to consider. So so this is this this equation is for non relativistic case but we have to consider the relativistic effect if the energy if we're going to consider it more than 100 kV then we have to consider the relativistic effect why because the velocity of electron becomes greater than the half of the speed of light here in this case so that we cannot ignore so that we have to incorporate in our uh, equation in the momentum equation and our equ uh, equation for wavelength modifies to plus ev by so this is a relativistic wavelength So after having information about electrons, so next, when the electron interact with the specimen, so we become interested in elect how the electron is going to behave after interaction with the specimen, like how it is going to scatter. So, as we have already discussed, the electron is treated in 
two different ways like in electron scattering it is a succession of particle while in electron diffraction we have to consider the wave theory so but one point to note as electrons are charged particles so we have all to con always consider the coulombic forces present there in the vicinity as they are very strong so what are the different terminologies used why uh, when scattering happens so one is like scattering can be forward scattering or backward scattering and how it is defined what is forward what type of scattered electron will consider as forward or backward if electron is scattered less than 90 degree then it is considered as forward scattering if electron is scattered more than 90 degree it is called backward scattering so when consider scattering if it is elastic then mostly it is coherent so the different points to consider when the electron is scattered through a thin specimen first elastic scattering which happens they are coherent that is they are having same phase and same energy after scat uh, scattered after being scattered and this only happens if specimen is thin and crystalline this elastic scattering they occur at very small angles they occur at small angles and mostly they are in forward direction at higher angles elastic scattering becomes incoherent then considering the inelastic scattering these are always incoherent for elastic scattering it can be coherent or incoherent depending upon at what angles they are being scattered but here it is always incoherent even at lower angles So these are all for uh, 
thin specimen but when the specimen becomes thicker come bulk very few electrons are forward scattered few electrons forward scatters and more back scattered they are mostly incoherent and they rarely contains the information about the incident beam mostly give the information about the specimen so when it is said small angle scattering so what value one need to give it small angle scattering one can give a new number or of upper limit it should be scattering should be less than 10 milli radian this 10 milli radian is somewhat equal to around 0.5 degrees the characteristic of scattering event are controlled by factors such as incident electron energy and the atomic number of the scattering atom so when we consider a specimen rather than a single atom factors such as thickness density crystallinity and angle of specimen to the incident beam they all become very important so there are different parameters to consider when first one has to consider what happens when electrons scatter from a single isolated atoms then what will happen that one can elaborate that idea to a crystal system and one can take that basic knowledge what happens when scattering is happening to in a isolated atom to a whole crystal so electron scattering by a single isolated atoms what are different things can happen incident beam falls on an atom so it may go unscattered or it may scatter at a particular area so one has to when considering a scattering from an isolated atom one has to consider the scattering probability that is the larger the cross section the better the chances of scattering scattering
probability what does that mean larger the cross section better the chances of scattering so cross section can be defined for an atom terms of its effective radius as pi r square and this r has different value for different scattering forces varies with different scattering process so what what is the important point consider we have to consider here which we can relate it to tm is whether or not the scattering process deviates the incident beam electron outside a particular scattering angle such that they do not go through the aperture in the lens or they miss the electron detector so we have to know the differential cross section uh, that will describe the angular distribution of scattering from an atom so here the solid angle omega we can relate it to theta and phi as 1 minus cos theta and when we differentiate it we get something as 2 pi sin theta d theta So from that we can say the differential scattering cross section is given by one by two pi sine theta d sigma by d theta and we can get this scattering cross section for an atom by integrating it from zero to pi. So from here we can say sigma decreases as theta increases as we keep on increasing the angle of scattering our cross sectional area keeps on decreasing. So from this is what happens when a single scattering is happening from a single atom. So when scattering happens from specimen we have to consider that cross section as total cross section we have to sum up the cross section for all the atoms where our total number will be given by n0 rho by a where here we can say n0 is the Avogadro number And here A is the atomic weight of scattering atom. So here 
sigma total is the number of scattering events per unit distance that the electron travels through the specimen and it is modified to n0 sigma atom rho by a and if we have a specimen with certain thickness with thickness t then our cross scattering cross section modifies to sigma t as n0 sigma atom rho t by a this rho t is called mass thickness of specimen what does this mean like if we are going to increase this t with the same amount this t will increase that is like if we we'll double the row the same effect we are going to get by doubling the thickness also that's why it's considered together Uh, so, uh, using uh, understanding different scattering uh, phenomena, like how this scattering we are going to use in TEM. So, as we select electrons that have been scattered to certain angle we are changing the effective scattering cross section this sigma because the scattering strength generally decreases as the angle of scattering increases as we see here right so there will generally be less scattering at higher angles which explains why we should be more focused in forward scattering in TEM so if we compare two electrons having two energy let's say 300 kV and 100 kV the total scattering cross section decreases as we will increase the energy of the electron scattering at 300 kV will be less than that at 100 kV so one has to remember this electron scattering at 300 kV will be less than electron scattering at 100 kV so this what does this imply the higher density regions of the specimen scatter more than lower density regions so that's why the sample preparation in TEM becomes very important so as we have uh, already considered scattering so next phenomena to consider is diffraction so let us first consider diffraction from two slits so 
So let's start with diffraction caused by one wavefront. Let's let's consider one wavefront that is incident on pair of very narrow slits here. Then we select two of the hygen wavelets. They must have the same phase at both the slits. So as they propagate past the slits, their phases dif differ depending on the position of the detector through which we are going to detect the wavelets. So important parameter here consider is the path difference between two wavelets which we are going to consider that is given by d sin theta l to t sin theta this is the path difference the two wavelets propagating in this direction let's say r they have the path difference of l and the phase difference of 2 pi l into 2 pi by lambda so if you plug it l here it becomes 2 pi by lambda times d sin theta so if this d and lambda are such that this phase difference is a multiple of 2 pi then the rays are again in phase and the amplitudes add up and the condition for this additive interference is written as d sin theta equals to n lambda All cons constructive interference so here we can see there is an inverse relation between d and theta as d decreases sin theta increases So, from this we can say when two wavelets are in phase then they add up and when they are opposite to each other then they cancel each other and the net resultant becomes zero. This relation between theta and d This totally depends on the position of slits. So this is a uh, condition which we got from two slits. So when we consider many slits so we get when we consider many slits
whatever diffraction pattern we are going to get, they adds up. Like if we we'll consider amplitude versus theta, then for zero degree when theta is zero the five rays all are in phase right, so we consider for many slits let's example of five slits here all five slits are in phase and just simply add up to give us the amplitude and as theta increases the rays become out of phase but they still add to give a resultant vector and when theta is exactly 360 degree by 5 like we have 5 slits so at 360 degree by 5 they will cancel each other which is around 72 degree and the resultant will become the resultant amplitude will become 0 and this is going to repeat at regular interval like the multiple of 72 like 2 into 72 that is at 114 degree 144 degree then 3 into 72 that is around 216 degree then 4 into 72 and so on So in between these values at let's say 108 degree with there is a local maxima we can see which is repeated at 180 degree and again at multiple of those angles so here we can see the amplitude is a strong function of theta and is proportional to the square of the amplitude so the scattered electron intensity is the becomes strong function of theta 2 so this diffraction patterns which we get this is a very peculiar pattern we get called airy disk which is nothing but fundamental limit on achieving resolution in TM which is given by 1.22 lambda by D it is called disk of radius So when we introduce any aperture into any microscope, we limit the resolution of the instrument with introduction of aperture the resolution of the instrument is limited
so as different angles are so important it is possible to control the angle of incidence of electrons on the specimen for which it helps us to collect whatever amount of information from the specimen with proper at, uh, incidence of electron at proper angles So electron diffraction patterns becomes very important here. Electron diffraction patterns. So as in TEM, using the electron scattering, they helps in collecting the information this about specimen by seeing how the electrons are distributed. Distribution of electron gives information about specimen here we can see several pictures from range of materials in TM the first one corresponding to amorphous carbon Second one is a single crystal. That's why we can see different spots which represent different planes of the single crystal. And here, third one represents polycrystal, and the fourth one convergent beam of electron so what observation we see here is most of the intensity is in direct beam in the center of the pattern we can see which means that most electrons appear to st travel straight through the specimen then secondly the scattered intensity decreases with increasing theta that that is we, as we are go, going away from the direct beam which ref, reflects the decrease in scattering cross section with increasing theta and lastly the scattering intensity varies strongly with structure of specimen So, after learning about different, diff like how electron behaves, now we are going into the instrumentation part.
like from where this first we will consider from where this electron is coming from the so electron sources so while considering this there are two kind of sources mostly present one is thermionic source that we may get from tungsten or lab 6 that can be field emission source that we get from tungsten filaments what's the difference basically this field emission source gives monochromatic electrons important point to remember while this thermionic source gives less monochromatic electron which also called whiter electrons so this two things depends on two phenomena like thermionic emission and field emission in thermionic emission it is if we heat any material to high enough temperature we give the electron sufficient energy to overcome the natural barrier that prevents them from leaking out from the surface this barrier is uh, known as work function and this thermionic emission can be summarized by a richardson's law which relates the current density from the source to operating temperature it relates current density to operating temperature here a is called richardson's constant it's constant for given source so from this equation we can see we need to heat the source to a temperature such that energy greater than this wave work function phi should be given to the electron then only they will escape from the source and we will available for an electron beam so the material to which we provide such high thermal energy they should be able to withstand that high tem high temperature so the possible thermionic source should be a refractory that is high melting point materials having very low work function high melting point low work function it's a very good materials which can be used as a source next after thermionic emission next is field emission field emission sources this is the concept of field emission and the principle behind it is that the strength of an electric field is increased at sharp points 
and we get the em emitted electrons from there. So when we provide electric field or to a spherical surface then the relation between the electric field and the voltage provided to the spherical surface is given by E equals to V by R. And using this tip, we produce the electrons. So, what are the different characteristic of electron beam that are being produced from this two type of sources? Characteristic of electron beam. One is brightness. which is nothing but current density per unit solid angle of the source then Second point is temporal, oh, then brightness is also given by current density is given by IC pi pi g0 by 2 square and solid angle of source is given by pi alpha square so brightness is given by by square 2 current density by solid angle given by 4 i e by pi d0 alpha 0 square once you remember this this here one thing is not considered like brightness increases with increase in the accelerating voltage for thermionic sources and the unit of brightness is given as to square steradium ampere per meter square steradium Next, 
proper characteristic of electron beam is temporal coherency and energy spread coherency of a beam of electron defined as how well the electron waves are there with one another as we have seen the white light is incoherent because it consists of photon with range wide range of frequencies so to get a coherent beam of electron we must create one in which all electron have same frequency so this temporal coherency it is a measure of how similar wave packets we are considering so if we consider all identical wave packets then they have the same coherence length this coherence length is given by vh by delta e where v is the electron velocity delta e is the energy spread of beam h is the planck's constant this means we must have stable power supply to the source and a stable high voltage supply so that all electron have a small delta e giving a well defined wavelength next factor for characteristic of electron beam is spatial coherency and source size this spatial co coherency is related to size of source that perfect spatial co coherence would imply that electrons were all coming from same point at the source so source size governs the spatial coherence and smaller sources give better coherency give better coherency the spatial coherence is defined as with respect to the effective source size is given by lambda by 2 alpha where lambda is the wavelength of electron and alpha is the angle subtended by source at specimen so we can control alpha by inserting an aperture in the illumination system so if this aperture is not limiting then it is a smallest source which sustains the smallest angle and thus has the highest spatial coherence so one can say if aperture is not limiting then that aperture is only the smallest source which have the smallest angle and highest spatial coherence
so spatial currency is more important than temporal currency because smaller sources provide higher brightness and better spatial currency but low stability so the next point to consider is stability So in addition to the stability of high voltage supply to a source, it's important that electron current coming from the source is stable. Otherwise, the screen intensity would vary. It will become very difficult to take properly the exposed image and make proper quantitative analytical measurements. So to summarize, the important properties of electron sources are brightness, temporal coherency, energy spread, spatial coherency, and stability. A small source gives higher brightness and better spatial coherency, but less stability. One can keep in mind a smaller source source size gives higher brightness. and better spatial coherency but less stability so next after learning about the electron sources we come to lenses apertures and their resolutions so why should we learn about lenses in tm these lenses obviously helps in controlling all the basic operational function of instrument so th the aperture plays a very vital role you we use apertures in the lenses to control the divergence or convergence of electron paths through the lenses which in turn affects the lens aberration and control the current in the beam that hits the specimen and we change the lenses so that we we change the focus, change the intensity of illumination or magnification by changing the strength of the lenses. So these are all important parameters so that we can we'll, we'll be able to see our specimen properly. This we have already uh, learnt about this lenses aperture resolution in SCM. Yeah, going forward, like uh, while considering uh, lenses and all, so two parameters become very important. One is depth of focus, and one depth of field. So this depth of field uh, is measured at object and it refers to object 2 it is the distance uh, that along the axis on both side of the object plane within which we can move the object without detectable loss of this focus in the image this is the optic axis this is the lens So here we can see this distance is called depth of field.
and this this is small reservable distance of our object similarly for image we can draw similar image and this distance will depict the tough field for image and this small reservable distance for image given by small dim so this alpha Im image given as d image by 2 by depth of field by 2 and the angle in the object is given as two. so from here the angular magnification is defined as alpha image by beta object and the transverse magnification is defined as image by d object which is nothing but inverse of angular magnification so the depth of focus is given as object by beta object times transverse magnification squared it's called depth of focus and depth of field is given as object by beta object so in different circumstances the limiting angle is defined by illumination aperture alpha alpha is called illumination aperture or the objective aperture is given by beta 0 in the objective lens so in thin specimens when which scatter weakly most electron emits from the specimen in a cone closer that defined by alpha of image which is very small and in thicker specimen more strongly scattering specimen happens and this objective aperture defines the angle so coming to the instrumental part so the illumination system first we have illumination system they take the electron from gun and transfer them to the specimen giving either a broad beam or a focused beam so in cm operation uh, we use a parallel a beam to the the optic axis let's consider the optic axis we have a gun here we have a c1 lens from there we have c1 crossover then we have c2 lens and when it is focused we will get a front focal plane of objective lens then we have upper objective lens which will send the parallel beam to the specimen
the first two condenser lens C1 and C2 are adjusted to illuminate the specimen with a parallel beam of electrons. The C1 lens first forms an image of a gun crossover. So in case of thermionic source, the original crossover may be very small, tens of micrometer. And this crossover is demagnified by order of magnitude. So in case of field emission gun, the source size may be less than the desired illumination area on the specimen. So it may be necessary to magnify the crossover. So the best way to get a parallel beam is to produce unfocused image of C1 crossover then focus it again. So in, uh, in its out of focus condition a lens is said to be over focused if it is strong and the crossover occurs before the image plane and under focused if the lens is weak and the crossover occurs after the image plane so the convergence angle become very important here so after converging the beam this focused beam after converging call it a probe So we use a probe to localize the signals coming from the specimen as in different characterization tool we do. Then we do all kind of operations to align our beam. That is translating, tilting the beam, alignment of C2 aperture. Then we correct the wobbling factor to correct the spherical aberration, chromatic aberration, and astigmatism. We you with the help of stick matters we correct that too then we form the we get an aligned beam so after that we form the image and in order to form the image first operation we need to know is viewing the diffraction viewing it in diffraction mode so in diffraction mode to see the uh, picture we have to adjust the imaging system lenses so that the back focal plane of the objective lens act as the object plane for the intermediate lens then the image is projected onto the viewing screen and in image mode, if you want to look at an image instead, we readjust the intermediate lens so that its object plane is the image plane of the object or the objective lens. Then an image is projected onto the wing screen. So to, in order to look at the images, basic principle TM operation is to put a SAD aperture into the image plane of objective lens G 
gives us proper image what is SAD here select that area diffraction So after imaging it, we get either a dark field or a bright field and we try to see it in a proper way. So, imaging can be done seen in two ways. One is bright field imaging and one is dark field imaging. So, we select the direct beam to form a bright field image. Which to form a bright field image, we select direct beam to get a dark field image. We select only electrons that are not in direct beam so whatever Uh, images we get we detect it through detectors so there are different kind of detectors present we'll discuss it in next class let's come to the question the condenser lens controls the size and intensity of electron beam in TM. That's true. By changing, by controlling the condenser lens by providing uh, the appropriate uh, electromagnetic field, we change the condenser lens and we accordingly we change the size of the electron beam. To control the beam current and convergence of beam hitting the specimen, we use aperture as we have discussed scanning coils helps to direct the current sample holder doesn't help in doing anything with the beam current and detector is just help to detect whatever information we want to detect from the specimen so aperture here is the correct answer so why TM image have much higher resolution than image from light microscopes it's because of the sources we use we use electron source in TM but in light microscope visible light is a source so electron uh, have a lower wavelength than the light uh, light so the resolution becomes better as resolution is given by sine inverse lambda by D so as the lambda decreases it's the resolving power increases so the correct answer is electron traveling as waves have wavelengths much shorter than visible light so when the following has the largest depth of field the scanning electron microscope has largest depth of field is because of very narrow electron beam we can uh, make in scanning electron microscope
so dark field image is produced in TEM by moving the objective aperture in a diffracted spot because uh, uh, in opposite to the dark field image bright field image would directly see the direct beam but in the, the dark field image up in opposite to bright field image we have to move the objective aperture to any diffracted spot the camera length in this transmission electron microscope is the distance between specimen to the screen for a given material what kind of information can be derived from TM we can get crystal structure we can get how lattice is repeated over distance we can also get crystallographic symmetry so all of the above information we can get from TM so if accelerating potential increases the number of diffraction spot increases because it will interact more with the crystal system and explain why the image rotates when the strength of mag of an electromagnetic lens is changed it is because of change in the Lorentz force because it tells us about the relation between the strength of the magnetic field and the rotation of the image because the Lorentz force we get cross product between the magnetic field and the velocity of the uh, electron right so that will give information about how the rotation is going to happen that call as we know the cross product tells us about the curling of the vector what we consider right so suppose the direct beam is blocked by aperture while one or more diffracted beams are allowed to pass through the objective apertures this condition lead to produce dark field images so, uh, so contours is absorbed in the image if sample is bent So, V zone law is given by H mu plus KV plus LW equals to 0. So, in a cubic system, which is analog to the scalar product of the direction and the plane normal. So which lens controls the size and intensity of electron beam in a TEM? That is condensation lens. Condensation lens controls everything. We can see. That uh, which contrast gives the lattice fringes in high magnification image is the phase contrast. We have read earlier in SCN. In a convergent beam electron diffraction, the diffraction pattern appears as set of disks The spot pattern arises from crystalline sample As we can see for amorphous we used to get for amorphous material we get a diffuse kind of rings for crystal line we get spot patterns for polycrystalline we get 
very clear rings so here is power, power pattern crystalline is the correct answer which of the following is the correct pathway of electron in TM is going from anode to electromagnetic lens system to sample then electromagnetic lens system again then to the screen the comparing dark field and center dark field imaging which one will give better resolution and why center dark field since intensity of diffracted beam is more as the intensity of diffracted beam will be more it will give us a better resolution so which pattern is observed by the thickness of sample is more this we will learn more in next class in TEM diffraction pattern is observed in back focal plane of the lens why the specimen have to be made as thin as possible in TEM because electrons have poor penetrating power Thank you.